Welcome to the Hazmat IQ Chemical of the Month. This series is designed to help you keep your Hazmat Q skills sharp. Please have your smart charts handy. Our scenario today is a forklift operator has just punctured a 55 gallon steel closed head drum on the loading dock. He immediately shut the motor off and got off the forklift. Before he left the area to report the release, he read the red DOT label on the drum. It read isopropanol UN 1219. At this point, pause the presentation and get your smart charts out. Ready? Step number one is our dispatch step. It's a 20 second size up that you learned in your class. And the first question that we want to ask ourselves is the first name of this material above or below the line? Again, as a reminder, our spill today is isopropanol. So we can look on page one or page two of our smart charts to figure this out. Again, our chemical name is isopropanol. And on page number two of our smart charts, we look at the 36 chemicals on, on this alphabetical list. We simply compare the list to our chemical spill and try to determine whether or not it is present. Today it is not. That gives us an indication that no, this is not a below the line chemical, but it's an above the line chemical. That makes it a red box chemical with possible traits and characteristics of flammability. We also know that the chemical name does not match any of the, of the asphyxiant gases in column number eight of the periodic table. So step number two is our response step. We take about two minutes to just verify our information that we determine that isopropanol is indeed a red box or a flammable chemical. We still need to verify this initial size up and isopropanol we know has these characteristics. It is a, a flammable liquid according to DOT and transportation it gets the red placard and that we know that isopropanol being a liquid is going to give us a hot zone of about 150 feet of, at least initially. Again it's a flammable liquid and the vapors are going to be heavier than air like all flammable liquid vapors will be. We verify this information again by checking with research sources. This includes the NIOSH book information on isopropyl alcohol or isopropanol. It has several synonyms. We also know that uh, its physical description is it will be a colorless liquid and that's what we have in our spill scenario. When we look at the chemical and physical property box, we can see that we have some other sides of information that we can verify. First of all, the molecular weight is 60. That tells us that anything over than 30 is going to have vapors heavier than air. We also know that this material has a flammable range because the LEL, lower explosive limit, to the UEL, upper explosive limit, is 2% to 12.7% 12 uh, flammable range. We also know that this is a flammable liquid that has a flash point of 53 degrees Fahrenheit, anything above that temperature and it should ignite readily. And then we also know that, that uh, we can use a flammable ionization detector or a photo ionization detector because its ionization potential is 10.10. So then we go to page number three, our, our chart number three, above the line. Again, from the chemical name, we know that the prefix is ISO. So that is found in the flammable name clue box that tells us that these chemicals burn because they char. So a FID will work with this. And then we look at the name clues or the family uh, type of chemical that is spilled. And we know that we have an alcohol type group. Alcohols have flammability and toxicity for hazards. And then we read right across the chart here on page number three on what uh, meters to pick. The meters to use here would be the temperature gun to determine if there's any uh, flammability taking place at that point or any changes in temperature. We also can use a combustible gas indicator to indicate flammability 
a PID and FID will help indicate lower concentrations in the air. And then also colorimetric tubes and chips will work for determining uh, alcohol in the air. And then finally, we can use uh, these types of protective equipment to respond to these incidents, including turnout gear with SCBA up to 10% of the LEL, and also level B protection will work up to about 1% of the LEL, and then level C will work below the immediately dangerous life and health level. So what we would call this response is a red six response, if we indeed had a playbook because red 6 is a flammable material and 6 is the alcohol family. So step number two, again, the verification step is very important because we want to verify and make a safety check that our initial assessment is accurate. And this information can also be found on page five of your smart charts. So are we indeed on track? And today we are. We know we have a flammable liquid. So step number three is the arrival or the get to work step. Upon arrival, we can get to work by gathering our identified equipment and assuring its readiness. So with the PPE, again, we want to make a determination on which uh, level of protection we're going to go with, get that equipment ready to go, and make sure that its uh, response readiness is, is accurate. And then also with our meter cockpit, we talk about flying in an airplane, and sometimes you can't see the ground when you're landing. And that's true with uh, metering of monitoring uh, flammable atmospheres. You might not be able to see the atmosphere, so you got to rely upon your instruments. And those instruments we already identified with step number two, we want to get out, make sure that they're ready to go. And we can uh, use this information on Smart Chart page five to help with this. And then finally, the last step that we want to do on our spill response is step number four, and that's the entry step. And we're going to make some determinations there on whether it's a rescue type operation or a work operation. And the red light, green light concept is something we always want to keep in mind is we want to be looking for certain atmospheres that may hurt us immediately. So those red lights are things like looking for radiation, also corrosive gases, especially the uh, elements of fluorine being present. And is there an increase in temperature that could uh, tell us that we need to get out of that atmosphere and then also, is it flammable? If it is, we should not be in there. So the red lights would uh, indicate a situation where we need to stop and reassess. The green light is uh, situations where we can use our monitors to determine that we can indeed do work safely. And those would be the parts per million type atmosphere determination. We also need to look at uh, what is our mission? Uh, what are we trying to do here in this situation? Is it rescue driven? or is it uh, plumbing type situations or leak sealing type situations? With all of these decisions, we need to trust our monitors and our PPE and make appropriate risk assessment decisions. So with rescue and plumbing situations, some uh, considerations to think about are making the environment safe. And that includes changing the environment through ventilation methods, for instance, like hydraulic or mechanical methods. Uh, rotating crews so we don't get anyone too tired or too heat exhausted. Shutting valves off, possibly remotely or even entering to make those shutoffs. And then PPE changes uh, refer to the fact that we may have to upgrade or downgrade our PPE decisions based upon the situation. And then finally, always consider waiting it out. That might be the safest uh, type of response in some indications or some situations. All right, so this uh, chemical of the month has been for isopropanol. Watch for the next month's chemical of the month on the first of each month. And you can even take the session quiz here to see uh, how accurate we were in our assessment. And then also look for more information on isopropanol as far as how is it, its use and also its characteristics for a little bit more background information. Okay, until next month, take care, stay safe.